This psalm is the diary of a man who is on a desperate quest. He is on the hunt for God. You, you, you don't have to be an expert to pick up on that. You don't have to be a great exegete to figure out. I mean, the very first thing he says right out of the hatch, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? I mean, anybody here having any trouble picking up on what that's saying? He, right out of the gate, he's like, God, where are you? I, I need to meet with you now. That's what he's saying. And then look at the end, all the way to the end of, of, of Psalm 43. Verse 3, he says, Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I'll go to the altar of God, to God, the joy of my rejoicing. I've got to get there. Guide me there. He, 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 he says that, and then the refrain, and then it's over. That's how he begins, that's how he ends. He begins, I'm dying to meet with God. When can I meet with God? Then he ends, God, give me, show me the way to your dwelling place. I've got to get there. I've got to meet with you. And as we go through this psalm, these two psalms, one of the things you're going to see is that these are words of desperation. This, this isn't just some religious phrasing that he picked up in Sunday school. You know, <clears throat> we just sang that song, As the Deer. Such a beautiful song, isn't it? I've always loved that song. It's such a beautiful song, but I'm wondering, I wonder if it's a little too beautiful for this, to fit the mood of this psalm, because this is a desperate prayer. I mean, this prayer, that song is just this sweet, soft melody, but this prayer, you get this, it's just loaded with angst and, and drama and desperation. You get the sense that if this guy d doesn't get what his soul is aching for soon, he's going to fall apart. He, I mean, he's not going to make it. That's the sense that I get from reading these psalms. It's desperate. A bunch of people in this room have already asked a bunch of other people in this room this question. How are you doing? Right? And I'm guessing the responses all came back, something like, fine, thanks, I'm fine. Raise your hand if you believe that every single person in this room is doing just fine. There's not one single discouraged soul in the whole place. I don't think so. And I'm not faulting you for saying no, I'm fine. I mean, what else are you going to do when you get 10 seconds in the hallway? But, but, but if, there, if we were in some different setting where you could just really sit down and listen and there was time, I wonder how many in the room right now would give an honest answer and say the same thing that this psalmist says in verse 6, Psalm 42, 6. My soul is downcast within me. The writer of this psalm was a good man who was in a bad place. He starts the psalm by saying he is dry and unsatisfied. Three times he says his soul is disturbed within him. Four times he says it's downcast. Twice he says he's going around mourning. Um, I believe that these two psalms, Psalm 42 and 43, are in the Bible to teach us how to handle those times in life when discouragement depression, sorrow, and the downcast soul comes over you. Um, most scholars believe that Psalm 42 and 43 were originally just one psalm. That's why we're taking them together. Um, they, 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 I don't know for sure if they were originally one, but they, I do know that they really go together in some obvious ways. There's a refrain that is repeated twice in 42 and then again in 43. Word for word, same refrain. Um, there's a theme that's the same. The question about being oppressed is the same word for word in both psalms. There's one heading for both psalms, which is unusual in this section of the book of Psalms. This portion of it, usually every psalm gets its own heading. So, so for those reasons, um, they seem to go together. We're going to study them together. From what I can tell from studying these psalms, there's no clear outline. I mean, his thoughts just jump back and forth. Off the charts hope, off the charts sorrow, uh, and the hopelessness, and, and now he's talking to God, and now he's talking about God, and now he's talking to his soul, and then back to prayer, and then he's all over the map with his thoughts. They're just up and down and in and out and all over, which is really no surprise. I mean, uh, 
People who are in anguished desperation typically don't speak in outline form, right? Uh, But as I've been studying this, even though there's no clear outline, it does seem to me that we can organize his thoughts under two main headings. First, his problems, then the solutions, okay? Um, From what I can tell, there are two main problems and three solutions. And this is the, these three solutions are a treasure for us. These, these psalms are a treasure for us in the church because these solutions will work for you, whether, no matter where your depression is coming from, whether it's some physical thing, medical problem that's causing your depression, or hardships in life, or no reason at all, or whatever, whatever the causes of your being despondent and discouraged, uh, the solutions, these three solutions will work for you. And so this really is a treasure for us, this passage. So let's look at his problems. He's got two problems. His first problem is what's happening to him. Second problem is what's happening in him. Um, What's happening to him is he's being mistreated. He's experiencing oppression and injustice, and he's being mocked. Uh, He talks about the oppression twice, 42.9. He says, why must I go about uh, mourning oppressed by the enemy? And then the exact same thing he says in 43.2, why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? To be oppressed means to be mistreated by someone who is more powerful than you. So you can't do anything about it. It's just injustice. These people are in positions of power, they're mistreating this guy, and they're using their power to take advantage of him, and there's nothing he can do about it. The only thing he can do is appeal to God. Um, that's the, and the pain that resulted from that injustice was absolutely intense. Look at verse 3 of 42. 42.3, 42, he says, my tears have been my food day and night. He says, I, I, when mealtime comes, instead of eating, I just cry. I just cry, and I can't stop crying. I'm crying in daytime, nighttime, all day. All night. I just can't stop crying. He's just weeping, this guy. He's, he's at the bottom. And, and look at verse 10. He says, my bones suffer mortal agony. Literally, in the Hebrew, it says, they shatter my bones. You've got to be pretty, pretty desperate to describe yourself that way I mean your suffering has to be pretty intense you have a hard day at work you come home and your wife says how was your day you, you, you say well I had a rough day right it has to be a pretty pretty I mean for you to come home and and you come home from school mom and dad how's your day and he's like well I feel like my bones are shattered inside me well that's a pretty rough day at school this guy is in unbearable anguish and he's trying to communicate that We don't know all that was going on that caused all this anguish, but evidently it involved uh, some false accusations against him because he was asking for vindication. That's how we know that. Look at 43.1, first verse of 43. He says, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. One of the most painful kinds of suffering in life is injustice. That's one of the hardest things to endure in life is just injustice. There's something about it that our soul just grates against. You know, if you, if you see injustice, like if your kid's, I mean, if your kid falls off his bike and gets hurt, that's, that's one thing, but if he gets beat up by a bully, boy, that's just a whole other thing, right? Um, when someone more powerful than you is treating you unfairly, it's just really hard to take, especially when you have no recourse. You can't appeal to anything. You can't appeal to anyone. That's where this guy is. And that's hard. But, but the impression, oppression and the injustice weren't even the worst part. The worst part for this guy was the taunting. Both the tears and the shattered bone comment come in connection with the taunting. Uh, look at 42.3 again. My tears have been my food day and night while men say to me all day long, where is your God? See, that's what pumped out the tears. And then again in in verse 10, my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? That's what crushed his bones. When his enemies got the upper hand, they used that to start taunting his relationship with God, start attacking his standing with God. Because he's losing and, and they're like, oh, well then where is your God? You know, sometimes we hear that from atheists, don't we? Where was God on 9-11? Where's God? All this pain and suffering and all terrible stuff going on. Where is your God? 
Where's this good God that you're supposedly believing in? Atheists like to capitalize on mysteries as if my inability to explain God would somehow disprove God. Like, how does my ignorance disprove a perfect God? That's like, that doesn't make any sense unless I was the one claiming to be God. Anyway, atheists might use this as a taunt, but actually, I don't think these are atheists here. There's actually very few atheists in the ancient world. I don't think they're doubting the existence of God. Their point is, God has abandoned you. They're telling the psalmist, they believe in God, and they're saying this God has abandoned you. They're saying, God, this God that's so important to you, he has turned against you. He's angry with you. He's rejected you. That's a painful thing to hear, especially when you're under God's judgment. If you're under God's discipline, it's really hard to hear that. You know, we all have things in our life. We have sin in our lives, right? We have all th- things in our lives that we know are displeasing to God. We know we, we've repented and our repentance falls short of what it should be. We're not what we do. And, 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 and we know that. We know we have, we have things that are wrong with us. And, and so when pain comes and suffering comes and they just keep coming and they intensify and they stack on top of each other with this, this relentless pounding and, and, and they're, not, they're not just going away like a normal trial. You know, normal trials, they come and they're there for a while and then they go away. But, but those ones that just stay and they stay and, and, and Satan is in there saying, God has rejected you. That's why this is happening. God has abandoned you. He's forgotten you. That's why this is happening. And, and you can start to believe it. That's what's happening to this guy. We don't know all the backstory of what, what made this guy so susceptible to this taunt, but he's susceptible, and it's getting to him. It's getting to him. They want to make him feel like he's been abandoned by God and forgot by God, and it's working because this is exactly how he feels. Look at verse 9, 42, 9. He says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? God, why have you forgotten me? 43, 2. Why have you rejected me? This is how he feels. He feels not only forgotten, but rejected by God. Now, obviously, he knows that's not actually true. Does he believe that God actually forgot him, actually rejected him? No, no, otherwise he wouldn't be praying to God, right? He wouldn't be writing this psalm. We'll see that he didn't actually believe that, but it is how it felt. That is exactly how it felt. It felt like God looked at him and said, I don't like what I see. I do not accept you. I reject you. And then just turned and and left him and forgot about him. That's how the psalmist felt. He felt that way. And and that's how it looked, not only to him, but to the people around him. The people around him looked and said, yeah, sure enough, God has forgotten him. God's rejected him. It's obvious. And they used that to try to destroy him. This is like a, this this is so hard to deal with. I've had this happen to me where people have said this. And it's, it's, there's a tendency to just let it happen if you feel like you have it coming. It's like a kid getting a whipping from his dad and his brother is standing right there saying, see, dad hates you. The psalmist is under God's mighty hand his enemies are using that to, to make him doubt God's love for him. So that's what's happening to him. Worse than that is what was happening in him. Inside him. What's happening inside him is discouragement and depression. Think of all the ways that he uh, describes himself um, in this psalm. First, as being dry and thirsty. What does it mean if a person describes himself as being dried up? So my soul is just dry. It's like a desert. There's no, there's no refreshment. There's no, there's no thriving. There's no life. You know, there's times when you experience hardship and trouble, and you can handle it. You can handle it. You, you, you deal with it just fine. Your soul has some reserves. It has some strength. It has resiliency and ability to handle trouble. But there are also those other times when they're desert times, when, when everything inside you just dries up and there are no reserves. You're, you're going on fumes, and, and even the smallest hardships just knock you flat because there's no flourishing. There's no thriving. There's no inner strength. That's this guy. He's dry and his soul is thirsty. 
Now think of what would it take to, to describe your soul that way? Let me give you a little exercise here. Think about all the different physical sensations that your body is capable of undergoing. So, so you can feel, what all can you feel? You can feel like softness against your skin, or you can feel hot and cold. You can feel itching or irritation uh, or um, rest, fatigue. Um, being pinched, being squeezed, all these different things that you can feel. So all the of all the stuff your body can feel, if you had to pick one physical sensation that would describe the way your soul feels right now, which one would you pick? This guy picked thirst. It's like, that's how I feel. You know when you're just really thirsty. Now, most of us really don't experience thirst. In this culture, we don't experience thirst much because we just got ways to drink just everywhere. So you're never very far from a 7-Eleven, right? So you, I mean, we don't experience this, but, but if you can imagine being in a culture where you can, if you've ever been in a situation where you don't, you're thirsty, you don't have anything to drink, you don't have any access to anything to drink, and you're not going to have access to water for a long time, it gets desperate. It gets to the point where it's so desperate, you're thir- you can't put your thirst out of your mind for even two seconds. Not even two seconds. It just, it just dominates. It's so, it, it, you have to get a drink. Um, that's how this guy felt just desperately unfulfilled. Unfulfilled. He was was longing, craving something that he did not have. He describes himself that way. Another word he uses to describe his soul is disturbed. (laughs) How are you doing this morning? Disturbed. That word means turbulence. It refers to when you have just anxiety and turmoil and and your whole insides are just boiling and you you just give anything for an hour of peace, inner peace, and just rest. But it won't happen because you can't stop the, 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 the turmoil inside your heart. So much anxiety. You know, again, sometimes hardships come and they're painful and they hurt, but you can deal with them and you can, you can set them, they don't rattle you. You know, the, the, you can maintain peace and calmness in your heart even as you deal with these hardships sometimes. But there are other times when they get under your skin, right? And they just, no matter how hard you try, you cannot put them out of your mind. You can't stop dwelling on them. Even in those times when you, you really need to be focused on something else. You need to be thinking of something else, and still those things, they won't go away. They just keep grinding away inside your soul nonstop. That's what's happening to this guy. He's just disturbed on the inside. And that kept going and kept going until he became downcast. And that, that word downcast means to be bent down into the dirt instead of having high spirits, you're just low. You have low, depressed spirits. It's very close to our word depression. Depression can be one of those agonizing kinds of suffering because it takes your strength away, right? You, you can't handle it. Sometimes it comes, depression can come in a whole lot of different ways. I mean, it'll come in incremental steps down sometimes. Other times it's just out of the blue, just a wave of darkness engulfs you from out of nowhere, no reason, and, and it's just, you're just in the dark. All of a sudden, all of your ability to, experience, to feel happiness is just gone. Just like somebody who loses his sight or loses his taste or his smell, you just lose your ability to feel happiness. It's just gone. You can't enjoy the pleasures of life. You have no strength. You have no energy, no motivation, no hope. A friend of mine was depressed. He, he wrote this. He said, I have no energy or reason to fight. I am numb, and I have tried all the things I know to try. I know that I will not be able to function like this much longer. There is no one to talk to. I'm suffocating. I can think all the best thoughts all day, and I still feel like this. No one knows how badly I want to die. My thoughts are obsessive and will not stop. They keep on saying, I want to die. Now, not all of us have gotten to that extreme before, but every one of us suffers the dark night of the soul to some degree, right? We all know what it means to be really, really down. So this guy's unfulfilled, he's disturbed, he's downcast, he's depressed. And then he says, why must I go about mourning? Um, that word literally means be in the dark. 
just, just, you know, sometimes life is bright and it's sunny, it's hopeful. Other times we find ourselves in this, just this frightening, chilling darkness of soul where you can't see. You just, you can't see any meaning to this stuff that's happening to you. You can't see any way out of this condition. You can't see anything hopeful on the horizon at all. It's just black. It's just dark. There's nothing to look forward to. All you have is just confusion and, and, and you feel lost and without hope. That's what this word is. And then one more description of how he feels. In 42.7, he says it's like waves and breakers sweeping over him. He's overwhelmed. If someone, if someone walked up to him in church and say, uh, how are you doing today, psalmist? He would, say, he would say, I feel like I'm out in the middle of the ocean and there's these huge waves uh, just one after just crashing over my head and, and, and it's one after another after another and I'm absolutely overwhelmed. I can't get a breath. You know, sometimes you can handle a trial. Sometimes you can handle two or three or maybe four. But, but when they just roll in like the waves one after another and they just keep crashing over you and just shoving you down and before you can get a breath, another one comes and pins you down, that, that kind of sense of being overwhelmed, it can be debilitating. And again, all of us experience it to, to one degree or another. Sometimes it's mild, other times it's severe. I mean, this can be anything from, from just getting a case of the blahs that lasts for a few hours, you know, or all the way to full-blown clinical depression that puts you in a hospital bed. It could be a, a child or a teenager that just wakes up one day and just, ah, I don't see any point of going to school. I don't see any point in doing anything. I don't have any friends. I don't have any motivation. I just can't get myself going. It could be a single person who really just wants to get married and the years just keep going by and there's more and more you get a year and year older every year and, and still no spouse, still no spouse. It could be a man who feels absolutely overwhelmed with the responsibilities of his job, his marriage, being a dad, taking care of the house, his ministry, dozens and dozens of tasks that need to be done and not only does it seem impossible to get them all done, it seems impossible to even keep track of them in my head and, and, and my wife isn't satisfied and my, my kids are complaining and the church is pushing me to do more and the, my boss is unhappy with me and I just feel completely deflated. This is how he felt. So, so those were his problems. Painful, overwhelming things were happening to him and painful, overwhelming things were happening in him. So, what's the solution? I mean, enough about the problem, right? Let's, let's, let's move on to the solution before people start slitting their wrists here. <laughs> How do you recover from the dark night of the soul? God is, he's going to give us the ultimate pep talk here. And I don't mean pep talk in the traditional sense. It's just that there were three points and two of them start with a P and one starts with an E. So if you can remember the word pep, then you can remember the three points. So, so when you're down and discouraged, think of pep. Pray for help, enjoy God, and preach to your soul. P-E-P. -E okay? Those are the main solutions, I think, that this psalmist points us to in this passage, Psalms 42 and 43. Pray for help. Enjoy God, preach to your soul. Start with prayer. Pray for help. If you, when you're in trouble, when something is getting you down, it's pushing you down, if you want, just pray for relief. Just pray for the problem to, to go away. Say, God, just take it away. You can pray that. You can ask God for that. Make these people stop hurting me. Make them stop, God. Make this illness go away. Give me health. Give me healing. Make my car stop breaking down. Or provide me with enough money so I can pay my bills. God, give me money. Just take the problem away. You can pray that. That's okay. There's nothing unspiritual about that at all. You're just like the psalmist. You've got painful things happening in you and you've got painful things happening to you and it's perfectly okay to ask God to do something about those painful things that are happening to you. Just ask for protection. Will God say yes to that prayer sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. If it's ultimately what's best for you in that moment, he'll say yes. Will God always say yes to that prayer? <laughs> Obviously not. Or we'd all be in heaven, right? None of us would be suffering. 
Um, sometimes, many times, suffering is what's best for you in that particular moment. And since God has promised to give whatever's best for you, then the trial's going to have to continue for, for now. But in many cases, many cases, your best interests and his greatest glory are all wrapped up in you asking for relief and him granting it. So go ahead and ask. Go ahead and ask. Ask for relief. Don't think that's unspiritual. Just to ask God to take the hardship away. The psalmists do that all the time. He does it here, 43.1. Look at the first verse of Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and wicked men. He, he's asking for two things there. He's saying to be rescue, rescue me and vindicate me. He wants to be rescued and vindicated. That's praying for relief. That's praying for the problem to go away, right? Because if, if someone's oppressing you and then you get rescued from that oppression, what does that mean? They're not oppressing you anymore, right? And that's what he's asking for. God, make the oppression stop. Make them stop. Let me ask you this Is God capable of doing that? Can he answer that prayer? Because, or, or, or is God so hogtied by human free will that he's up in heaven saying, sorry, I can't intervene here because that involves free will? No. No, rescuing us from people who are mistreating us is no problem for God at all. It's easy for him. It's, it's, he's so easy. He could do it in his sleep if he slept, which he doesn't. God is so powerful and so wise, he can actually figure out ways to prevent evil people from doing bad things to you, even while leaving their free will perfectly intact. It's like, how does he do that? I don't know. I don't know how he does it, which is one of the billion reasons why I'm disqualified from ever being God. But he knows it's no problem for him. For him, it's absolutely elementary. It's just simple, simple, elementary, easy stuff for him. No problem whatsoever. He can protect us from people. Jeremiah 20, 11, The Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail, and they will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. It won't work because God is protecting me. They can't get, do what they want to do. God is fully capable of delivering us from anything or anyone, any time. No problem. But what about that other request? That one's a little different because he says, vindicate me. Vindicate me in the eyes of whom? Of God? No, no, because God, I'm all, God already knows the truth. I mean, these, these deceitful men who are lying about me, he, he's not fallen for their lies. He knows it's their lies. So I don't need to be vindicated in his sight. He's asking to be vindicated in the eyes of men. He's asking about God to do something about people's opinion of him. This guy is wrongly accused that people are, they're, they're, he's being lied about and, and people are believing those lies. All the people around are believing that the lies are true and, and he can't do anything about it. He can't make them change their mind and so he just asks God, God, you change their mind. You vindicate me in their eyes so that they don't believe those lies anymore. Instead of people having negative opinion of me and not trusting me, make them have a positive opinion about me and, and trust me. Now, let me ask you this. Is God capable of answering that prayer? Can God actually grant you favor or disfavor in the eyes of men? Absolutely. Again, it's easy for him. He can do it effortlessly. Effortlessly. No problem. He's done that many times. Granted people favor in the eyes of other people. For example, Genesis 39, 21. The Lord, uh, the Lord granted Joseph favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Let me just pull this up and I can advance. There it is. Joseph was in a situation where you got this unbelieving prison warden and God somehow managed to make it so that this prison warden had a favorable attitude towards Joseph. God can do that. Daniel 1.9, now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. God did it. God did that. Exodus 12.36, and this one's kind of funny. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave them what they asked for. That was during the Exodus. So they're, I mean, they're, they're all escaping and they're just like, okay, well, we're leaving Egypt and uh, by the way, uh, give us your stuff. Okay, 
<laughs> God can do that. Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. God is fully capable of making people like you. He's fully capable of making people trust you or withholding that. He's totally sovereign over everything, including that. Now, are there some things that you can do that will have an impact on whether people trust you or whether people like you or dislike? Well, of course, yeah, of course. I mean, Proverbs is is loaded with things that we need to do to maintain a good reputation, and that's wisdom. We need to do those things, and we should do those things. Uh, But ultimately, it's up to God. Ultimately, whether those things work or not is going to be up to God. You could be the most trustworthy human being on the planet, and if God doesn't grant you favor in the eyes of men, people aren't going to trust you. And on the other side, you could have lied and stolen and done everything you can to destroy people's trust, and if God grants you favor in the eyes of men, they'll, they'll trust you, and they'll like you. It's up to God. Now, if somebody has a sinful attitude towards you, that doesn't come from God. God never causes someone to have a sinful attitude or a sinful anything, but God is sovereign over whether or not that sinful attitude is allowed to happen or not. So if people are believing lies about you, can you pray and ask God to vindicate you in in those people's eyes? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what the psalmist is doing here. You can pray for relief. You can pray for relief. You say, well, what what if I don't deserve relief? (laughs) Well, if you think this is about what you deserve, you're totally in the wrong religion. Don't ever, don't ever hesitate to ask God for something just because you think it's too much to ask. There's no such thing as too much to ask with God. He loves to show his infinite riches and his infinite generosity. He loves doing that. If you, wanna, if you feel like you need to repay God for his kindness to you, you owe him something and you want to repay him, the only thing you can do is just repay him by Asking him for even more so he can show himself to be even more generous and put his generosity on display even more. Psalm 116, 12. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I'll lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I'll just say, Lord, more please. That's all I can do. It's the only thing I have to offer him is my neediness so that he can put his grace on display. So the first principle in dealing with discouragement, pray for help. Pray for help. Ask God for relief. Ask him for strength. Ask him for whatever you desire. Whatever is in your heart. He loves to answer those prayers. However, however, I need need you to understand. This is so important. You need to understand that relief from your suffering won't be enough. It's wonderful. Ask for it. He might grant, but even if he grants it, it won't be enough. You can, get, you can get relief. You can get that person to stop hurting you. Your boss can stop treating you bad. Uh, the, the bully at school can back off. Your spouse can stop doing whatever your spouse is doing is driving you crazy. You get all that, your financial troubles could just go away and you have tons of money. All of that could happen, and you could end up just as depressed as ever, just as discouraged as ever. What you need is joy. That's what you, you, you've got to get joy. Depression is the absence of joy in your heart and you, and, and you need to get that. This guy who wrote these psalms senses that. He knows that's what he needs. You can tell he senses that because of how he prays and what it is he's thirsty for, the main thing he's thirsty for. I mean, that verse that I read about him asking for vindication at the beginning of 43, that's the only place in this the entire two psalms, that's the only place where he asks for relief from his suffering. Relief from suffering would be nice, but he knows, he knows that in itself is not going to be enough. He needs something far greater than that. He needs joy. He needs the hope and the, the life and vibrancy that comes from being in the presence of God. That's what he's desperate for. That's the only way out of the pit that's going to last And so this is the, the E in pep. Pray for help, then enjoy God. Enjoy the presence of God. 
This is why he starts out the psalm so desperately thirsty. Not thirsty for relief, not thirsty for troubles to go away, thirsty for the presence of God. And at the end of the whole thing, end of 43, he's begging God, guide me into your presence, guide me into your presence. I've got to find your dwelling place. Beloved, don't ever be satisfied with just getting rid of your sorrows. You need more than that. You've got to go beyond just being okay. You've got to find joy, real, happy, emotional joy. We only have time today to just introduce this concept, so um, we'll plan on getting into it in a lot more depth next time. Uh, but for now, let me just give you a basic kind of framework, just a picture of it, a snapshot, and then we'll, 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 we'll try to dive in next time. In order to have happiness in your life, uh, you need to enjoy God through three different ways. Through his past kindness to you, present grace, and future grace. Okay? Past, present, and future grace. God's design for you is to uh, live life with three sources of joy feeding into your life. So if you think of your life as a, as a river of joy and it has to be full to the banks with joy um, in order for you to, to, to get by, there's three tributaries, three creeks that are feeding into there. One from the past, one from the present, one from the future. Um, discouragement happens when one of those three tributaries gets blocked. One of those streams flowing in gets blocked. A big boulder tumbles down and, and clogs up the inflow of one of the sources of joy. Any one of those three gets clogged, any one of those three gets clogged up and you're, you won't have enough joy. Your life will dry up. You have to have all three flowing. And, and, you, and so you have to be in a, in a constant practice of enjoying God's goodness from the past, his goodness now, and his, his, his future goodness. And if that sounds a little weird to you, you think, future, enjoy the past, enjoy the future, how can I do that? That's not weird. We do that all the time. There's nothing weird about that. You enjoy past and, and future all the time. Um, God enabled us to do that. We're, it's a special thing that we have as human beings. We're not like the animals. We can actually enjoy the past. God gave us memory to enable us to enjoy his past grace. That's the purpose of memory. Memory, you can enjoy the past through memory, can't you? All you have to do is think back on some really wonderful thing in the past, some real, some, some real delightful memory. If it's a pleasant enough memory, then jo joy will flow right into your life just by thinking about that thing. Right? Isn't that amazing? You're not, it's gone, it's over, it's not even happening now, but you feel happiness just because you're remembering it. Memory can do that. Same thing goes for enjoying the future. Um... You see somebody at work and he's walking on cloud nine. He's all happy, really good mood. And everything. Why are you in such a good mood? Ah, I'm leaving on my dream vacation tomorrow morning. Nine o'clock, getting on the plane, I'm going. Or, or yeah, yeah, I'm getting married tomorrow. And so he's just he's all happy, super good mood today. And it's like, well, why are you in a good mood today? Why are you happy right now? You're not married now. You're not on the beach now. None of the pleasures of your vacation or marriage, none of it's happening now. You're just at work, and work's just the same as, it's just as miserable as any other day. Why are you happy? Well, because I'm thinking about tomorrow. See, God gave us the ability to actually enjoy something before it even happens, just by thinking about it. That's called hope. The biblical term for that is hope. Hope is when you know something good is coming and you already feel good because of it, just by thinking about it. So, so you enjoy God in the past you, by, through memory. You enjoy God in the future through hope and then you enjoy God in the, presence, in the present by, by going to his dwelling place, by experiencing his presence. And all three of those uh, you can see in this guy's prayer. He, regarding the past, he remembers. He calls on his soul to remember. In, uh, in 42.4, he says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. I think about it. I remember it. Then in verse 6, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. He, he, he uses memory to fight discouragement. He knows the solution to being downcast in his soul is to remember. 
So that, that stream of joy coming from the past, God's past grace, has been clogged up. It gets clogged up by the misuse of memory. We misuse our memory a lot, don't we? God gives us memory to remember his past grace, and we use it to remember sin, right? Recall sin or, or remember hardships that are done against us or who, any number of things, um, and we, we spoil it through ingratitude. God wants to, 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 for us to unclog that stream and get back to gratitude so that Joy is flowing into our lives from the past. He also wants us to get the, the stream of joy from the future unclogged. And, and, and the psalmist is, is understanding that too. That's why three times in this refrain that happens three times, he calls on his soul to hope, to put its hope in God. Remember, hope is about the future. 42.5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. My Savior and my God. Then 42.11, same thing. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed? Put your hope in God. Then 43.5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed? Put your hope in God. He has to keep telling himself that. He has to keep telling himself. In fact, he never does get it fully. The very last verse of the whole thing, he's telling himself that again. Soul, come on. He's calling his soul to hope in God's future grace. It's hard. He has to keep reminding himself. But he knows that's where the answer is. He knows it's, it answers in thinking of future grace. Think of, a, think of how creative God is. We'll plan on getting into this more next time, but just, for, just real quickly. Isn't it true that God has done stuff in your life just the past 12 months? It's, it's, a, new, it's a new grace? He never, he never did that for you before? I'm having, I mean, this last year, it's amazing, uh, the stuff that God brings up. And you think after guys lived 46 years, then God's out of ideas. I mean, how many more new things can he think up? And yet, he never runs out of ideas. God never runs out of ideas. He is infinitely generous. He is infinitely rich. He is infinitely powerful. And you can't even f begin to fathom the height and depth and length and width and breadth of his love for you. He's got some marvelous things in store for you in the year 2016. Unclog the stream of joy from the future. Think, anticipate God's future grace. And then most important of all, enjoy God now, here and now, in the present. That's, that's the biggest desire of this guy's heart. He wants to enter into God's presence and have an experience of his presence that will satisfy that, that, that emptiness in his soul and it'll, it'll take care of that thirst he wants, he wants an experience of God that will get rid of the dryness in his life and, and an interaction with God that will fill the emptiness of his soul. And so he starts out as the deer pants. I'm panting, God. I'm thirsting for God. When can I go meet with God? And then he ends it. Send forth your light. Show me the way to your presence. I want to experience your presence now. I want to enjoy your presence now. Nothing in this world will be enough to give this guy joy in the midst of his darkness, except that. He knows that. Nothing's going to work except the presence of God. I've got to experience his presence. That's what he wants now. That's what he thinks about when he remembers the past. That's what he anticipates in the future. All right, so that's just kind of a roadmap. That's just kind of a basic idea of what we're doing in this study. Um, the way to get out of depression is... P, pray for help. Then E, enjoy God's kindness in the past, present, and future. Uh, and, and then the third point, preach to yourself. We didn't get to that. We're not going to get to that very soon. Um, we got a lot more to say about E, so don't get your hopes up about the last P just yet. But, but uh, we'll get there. Um, so so that's, the, that's the overall picture. That's the outline. Now, if you're depressed today... My guess is the sermon I just preached didn't help much. In fact, you might even be more discouraged now than you were at the beginning of the sermon because you're thinking, great, my, 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 my only shot at, <laughs> at joy is past, present, and future enjoyment of God, but I've tried that. I, I think about the past. It doesn't bring me any joy. None. 
It brings me more sorrow. Whenever I think about the past, it just increases my sorrow. I think about these horrible things. And when I try to have fellowship with God now, here in the present, I open up my Bible. I get down from my devotions. I get on my knees. I open my Bible. I pray. I read. And honestly, it's boring. It's dry. My prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I mean, if I'm totally honest, I have to say, I come to church, it's boring. And when I look at the future, that's not happy. I look at the future and all I see is blackness. That makes me even more depressed. I don't have anything to look forward to. I know his promises in the Bible should make me happy, but they just don't. So, so now what? Well, if that's you, please understand, first of all, that this sermon, all it is is a basic sketch. I've told you what will bring you joy. I haven't talked yet about how to get it, how to actually do it. How to, how to experience the presence of God. So, so uh, this psalm has a lot to say about that. So take heart. Hang in there. Come back next week. And we'll plan on digging in how this is done. And specifically, how you can manage to do this even in a time when you're totally depressed and you, you don't have any motivation, you don't have any energy. Uh, there's hope. Okay, there's hope. There's a, there is a way out of this darkness you're in it might take us a few weeks to get through it all but 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 for this week just for the next seven days all you need to do is take the next step it's going to be a slow process that's okay just for now just take the first step and the first step is to rest on this promise zephaniah 317 the lord your god is with you he is mighty to save He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will. Circle that word, will. He will. He will. Spend your whole week just leaning on that promise, just just clinging to that promise. Write it on your hand. Put it on a sticky note. Memorize it. Put it on the mirror in your bathroom. Whatever you have to do, get it in front of you. Do it. Meditate on it. Lean on it. Depend on it. And do you want to hear some really fantastic news? Anytime you have your devotions and and you read and you pray and you walk away not feeling joy, the only reason that happens is because it didn't work. You didn't experience the presence of God. If you're not getting joy from your devotions because they're not working, you're not experiencing His presence, you say, how is that good news? That's terrible news. No, it's great news. It's great news because... Because there's hope for you. Look, if you experienced the presence of God and you went away without joy, you'd really be hopeless. Right? If God's not enough for you, you're done. But that never happens. Never, ever does that happen. No, with nobody. It's not a situation where some people, it's, it's for them, and for other people, it's not their thing. They, they're just not the type that really enjoys God's presence. No, there's nobody like that. The, the, the God's presence bringing joy into the human soul is a property of God's nature. It's, it's an attribute of God, just like his holiness or his eternality. There's, it's impossible for, God, for a human soul to encounter the presence of God and not get joy. Impossible. It never happens. Never, never, ever. The presence of God always has a strengthening, life-giving effect on the human soul. Always, always, always. It has never failed a single time in the history of the world. So all you have to do is find a way into the presence of God. Now, that's, not, that's easier said than done. I, I, I know that's not easy, which is why this it wasn't even easy for the psalmist. That's why he's begging God, show me, send your light, send your truth, just show me the way into your dwelling place. Show me h- how to find your presence. He's begging him. So it's not easy, but, but if you can do it, it'll work. He will be the joy of your rejoicing, just like this psalmist says. And the more times you do that, you have an experience like that, you're going to start stacking up memories that you can, you're, you can go back to and get that, that stream flowing and you're going to start anticipating it happen the next time and you get that stream flowing and you'll know how to do it in the present and you're going to have joy. So, so as we close, I want you to think about this. I just want you to picture something in your mind. Picture... Some hardship that might happen this week that would be the sort of thing that would put you into a tailspin. I realize this is risky to ask depressed people to think that way, but, but 
think about that for a minute. Just imagine something that might happen this week that would put you in a tailspin. And, and, and it, 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 something that if it happened to you, it, you, would re, you really would just struggle with discouragement and, 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 and all that. And I want you to imagine that thing happening. And now picture yourself, when it happens, turning to God and actually having an experience of his presence, an experience of his presence that's so profound that your heart is delighted by it, delighted, so delighted by it, that you come away with joy that's greater than this sorrow you're feeling. Do you believe that God's presence has that property? Do you believe the promise of Zephaniah 3 that he will quiet you with his love? If you experience his love, to the degree that you experience his love, it will quiet your soul, your agitated soul. It will. We just sang all those songs. Your touch restores my life. You know, the, the, uh, you, you, your name is power, breath, and living water. Uh, you, do you believe that? None of the principles that we're going to learn about how to draw near to the presence of God in this psalm are going to work until your soul is desperately thirsty for his presence. Not thirsty for anything else, just, just, just for his presence. And that's never going to happen until you believe this promise. You got to believe it. Do you believe it? Do you believe the promise of Psalm 80, 19, that says that all that has to happen is for God's face to shine on you and you'll have restoration. That's all that has to happen. Do you believe the promise of Hosea 5.1 that says all he has to do is turn his face toward you and it'll turn your misery into healing? Do you believe that 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 works that way? Do you believe the promise of Psalm 16.11 that in his presence there is abundance of joy and perpetual pleasure? Or the promise of Psalm 21, 6, that the, that the joy of his presence will make your soul glad. Spend a week resting, just resting on those promises. And then we'll come together next week and talk about how to experience his presence. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these marvelous, great, and precious promises. Help us to believe them. Teach us how to believe them, for we pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died to purchase these promises for us. Amen.